you hate government, one of them libertarian types, or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers. Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quote, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Okay, you guys, welcome back to the show. It's the Scott Horton Show here on the Liberty Radio Network. Next up is the great Alfred W. McCoy, professor of history at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He writes uh, regularly for TomDispatch.com and is the author of quite a few books, including The Politics of Heroin, A Question of Torture, and most recently, I believe it is, Torture and Impunity, The U.S. Doctrine of coercive interrogations. His latest for Tom Dispatch, which is running today at antiwar.com under Tom's archive here, is uh, called The Real American Exceptionalism, From Torture to Drone Assassination, How Washington Gave Itself a Global Get-Out-of-Jail-Free Card. Welcome back to the show, Alfred. How are you, sir? Good, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Uh, very happy to have you back on the show. <clears throat> very important article that you've written here, uh, like pretty much everything I've ever read of yours uh, in the past. Uh, you start out with a thinker, a conservative thinker named Carl Schmitt. Who's Carl Schmitt? Carl Schmitt was a very influential thinker in Germany in the 1930s. He was the chief judicial officer under the Nazi government, um, and he influenced uh, his protégés, most importantly Leo Strauss, who trained uh, a number of the Bush neoconservatives at University of Chicago. Strauss's students included, for example, Paul Wolfowitz, who was a key architect of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, and he's now an advisor to Jeb Bush on foreign policy. Uh, and Carl Schmitt said very famously, the sovereign is he who decides the exceptions. And that has become, if you will, the sort of philosophical underpinning of the U.S. world order since the end of the Cold War. Uh, really, dating back to the 1950s with our great victory in World War II, the United States became the world sovereign. And more than any other single power, we breathed into life the idea of international community. We wrote many of the laws. We created the, many of the institutions, the United Nations, uh, the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank. Uh, these are all U.S.-inspired, U.S.-endorsed institutions. And at the same time, we began breaking the rules that we have been writing. Because as world sovereign, we're the power, the sole power, who can decide the exceptions to these important international rules and laws. Mm. <clears throat> and now, so... It seems really to go against our our very most, well, my very most basic kind of childhood <clears throat> conceptions of America, the way it was explained to me. Ronald Reagan is just a citizen. He's not anything special other than he temporarily is sitting in the job of chief, chief executive of the departments of the government. That's all. Uh, but he doesn't have really any more rights or responsibilities than anyone else. And he only has authority under law. And, of course, that's pretty much mythology, but that's what we're trying to live up to here in America, I think, or maybe we were once upon a time. Uh, well, but I can see how, as a foreign policy, uh, as, as our foreign policy is the opposite of that, we kind of lose that conception more and more here at home as well. Well, I mean, it, it's still true. The President of the United States is the head of government. Uh, he or she is governed by the laws of the land. Uh the laws that spring, of course, from our Constitution. Of course, there's there's one problem. Uh, you know, the United States has been building in the aftermath of World War II, and particularly expanding it uh, since 9/11, a vast secret state. You know, this is something that was intelligence. This whole vast covert domain of the of U.S. governance, particularly abroad, is something that is completely beyond the Constitution. Um, uh, let me put for let me let me repeat an axiom that I I put forward in this article that there is a fundamental contradiction between state secrecy and the rule of law 
And as one grows, the other inevitably shrinks. And in the aftermath of World War II, we created the Central Intelligence Agency. you got to understand that, you know, for the first really 150 years of the American Republic, we didn't have a state security apparatus. Uh, when World War I started, when General Pershing led two million Americans to fight in France, we had the only army on either side of the battle lines in World War I that didn't have an intelligence service. Uh, and this, this aversion to secrecy and to, uh, to intelligence is something that's very deeply ingrained in the United States. We, during World War I, we, we created an intelligence service. But in the 1920s, Republican conservatives cut it way back on the grounds that this was a, a, a threat to U.S. civil liberties and a violation of the Constitution. Uh, and indeed, that, that instinct to cut and curtail secrecy has remained strongly bipartisan. I mean, after World War II, the Democratic president, Harry Truman, killed the Office of Treaty Services. Uh, and then, of course, later on, he created the CIA. But nonetheless, he killed it. Uh, after the Vietnam War, President Jimmy Carter fired uh, 800 CIA covert operatives uh, uh, to curtail that dimension of CIA activities. Uh, and, and so, you know, since 9-11, this dimension of the U.S. state has grown enormously, and so has the violation of the rule of law, particularly in the international arena. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, I wonder whether the people in D.C., I mean, Paul Wolfowitz, I'm sure, understands. Well, I don't know what he understands, honestly. But I wonder if if the, uh, the irony is completely lost on them, that um, it's perfectly okay, they say, for America to be the rogue state, as long as we're enforcing what we claim is the world law on everybody else, which that's always the excuse for the war in Libya, the war in Iraq, uh, the war in Kosovo, etc. It's always to enforce the will of the United Nations and protect the poor people from their own governments, etc., like that. Yeah, the, I think one of the, the, the most visible manifestations uh, of this contradiction between our commitment to the rule of law at home and international law abroad, and this idea that the, the U.S. sovereign, particularly in the world arena, has the right to, uh, to exceptions to that law, came over the torture debate. Uh, last, just, uh, let, me, let me put it this way, let me wind back. Okay. Uh, at the start of the Cold War, back in the 1940s, um, the U.S. was a very strong advocate for this idea that uh, torture was an abomination. Indeed, one of the strongest principles uh, of international law and human rights law for the last 300 years has been a campaign to abolish torture as a prerogative of, of state power. And uh, uh, in 1948, uh, the United States had a predominant role in the writing of the UN Decor Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which specifically bans torture. A year later, we... Uh, were the prime mover in the enactment of the Geneva Conventions for Humane Treatment in War, and that has a specific prohibition against torture. Simultaneously and secretly, however, the CIA began developing secret new techniques for psychological torture to be used against the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And right, So right from the outset, there was this inbuilt contradiction. Uh, and that campaign for the international rule of law and the ban of torture continued in 1984 in a truly extraordinary act, the United Nations General Assembly, representing 159 member states, voted unanimously to approve uh, the UN Convention Against Torture. And we ratified that convention a decade later in 1994. The Cold War was over. The CIA had given up its torture techniques, it had expunged it from its manuals and all the rest. Um, yet, even... As we signed the UN Convention Against Torture, which contains under Article 3 a ban on extraordinary rendition, a ban on sending somebody from one jurisdiction to another's jurisdiction where they're going to be tortured. And right away, President Clinton, a year after he signed the UN Convention Against Torture, authorized the CIA to engage in extraordinary rendition. We began snatching people in the Balkans and sending them to Egypt where they were subject to horrible torture. Uh, CIA Director Tenet later testified that before 9-11, we engaged in at least 70 extraordinary renditions. Every single one of those is banned under Article 3 
of the UN Convention Against Torture, which we signed. And right. since 9-11, the exceptions have gotten thicker and deeper and more common. All right. And more on those lines when we get back with Alfred McCoy, author of Torture and Impunity, the U.S. Doctrine of Coercive Interrogations. So you're a libertarian, and you don't believe the propaganda about government awesomeness you were subjected to in fourth grade. You want real history and economics. Well, learn in your car from professors you can trust with Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom. And if you join through the Liberty Classroom link at scotthorton.org, we'll make a donation to support The Scott Horton Show. Liberty Classroom, the history and economics they didn't teach you. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Alfred McCoy, professor at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And uh, the book I read, uh, well, I read Politics of Heroin a long time ago, but I read uh, Question of Torture. I haven't read the most recent one. Uh, but, boy, is that book a nightmare, all this stuff in there. Uh, I'll tell you. Okay, so we're talking about the real American exceptionalism. It's running today at antiwar.com under uh, Tom Engelhart's name here. And um, we're talking about how the law doesn't apply to America because America is the law. And so, but that kind of gets down to the heart of this thing about whether Carl Schmidt is really wrong uh, in saying that, hey, the most powerful person, in this case America, with the biggest military and. Uh, in, in by many measures, still the biggest economy, we get to call the shots. And the world is somewhat lucky that we have a public relations scheme that promotes things like bans on torture in other countries, even when they don't apply to us. Um, but isn't it really the case that world law means nothing without an enforcer and and that and that, you know, probably enforcement can't be accomplished Without breaking all those laws, like, for example, starting wars, which is you know, the first thing all this post-World War II stuff bans, right? Yeah, but the, the, one of the things I think that's really striking about the age we're living in is the nature of warfare is changing. We're moving away from the old model of heavy metal warfare of uh, you know aircraft carriers and heavy cruisers and tanks and all the rest. And uh, <clears throat> under President Obama, there has been a systematic shift of U.S. force projection from the conventional arena of, let's say, air, land, and sea to aerospace and cyberspace. And <clears throat> this represents a real challenge for the rule of law, because what's, what's happened really in the, in the past hundred years since the United States has helped build the international rule of law with the international courts is that there's been a, if you will, Tech, military technology moves in, in seven-league boots, leaping ahead by great bounds, and the law kind of follows along in smaller footsteps trying to catch up. And what we've got now is that the, that the U.S. force projection, its war fighting capacity, is moving into two domains that are still unregulated, aerospace and cyberspace, and we're working very hard to keep them unregulated. Now, the... Uh, one of the, the, the key facets of the international community that the United States built after World War II, enshrined in the United Nations, is this idea of national sovereignty, that every nation state has inviolable control over the people and the affairs inside its own national, international boundaries, okay? So the question then is, how high is sovereignty? How high does your sovereignty extend? Does it go up a mile? Does it go up 10 miles? We know under the law of C that it now goes out 200 miles, but how high is it? And the fact is there's no rule. There has been a successive failure of international law to define the upward limits of sovereignty. At the Paris Air Convention in 1910, the Hague Convention on the, the Laws of Air Warfare in 1923, the failure of Protocol 1 of the Geneva Convention in 1977, in other words, there's been a successive failure by the international community to define the rules of air warfare and the height of sovereignty. So we can fly a drone, in theory, over anybody's boundary. We can fly a, uh, a satellite over anybody's airspace, and there's no restriction. So that's, uh, that's one dimension of U.S. exercise of global power. And indeed, we've used drones to engage in, let's say, just Pakistan, about 3,900 
extrajudicial executions with considerable collateral damage. But wait, so what you're saying is you're not saying that no state has the right to attempt to fight our drones trespassing, but you're just saying there's no law that makes it uh, an international crime to use air power to kill people or at least to fly over other people's countries uh, no, as long as they no can't limit. shoot it down. Right. I mean, in other words, satellites fly over international boundaries all the time, right? Sure. No, and nobody regards that as a violation, but they're only 250 miles up. Who so there's no say, difference between that and a Reaper drone in terms of the in, law? In terms of the law, there is no definition whatsoever. In other words, uh, you know, if you ask some lawyer in the Pentagon how high is sovereignty, a puckish lawyer might respond, as high as you can enforce it and no higher. So in other words, we have sovereignty over airspace because we've got air defenses, right? Mm. But that's, that's yeah, not boys. actual enshrined in law. That's just the exercise of power. So there's no limit on these drones, okay? Well, that was fine for us as the world power, and we're the only people that have drones. But just this week, President Obama authorized the exports of drones to allies. Of course, the end use control over that is, is, is vague. And, you know, once you give people a weapon, they can use it as they fit. The Chinese are starting to manufacture drones, and the, 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 they're also just about to have the one key technological uh, item that you need to transform a, uh, a model airplane into a drone, satellites. You've got to have over-the-horizon communication capability. That only comes from satellites. From 1965 to the present, the United States has had the only global system of telecommunication satellites. Well, in 2020, the Chinese will have finished the launch of 35 satellites. They'll have the world's second and that means they'll have the world's second capacity for global drone use just like ours. Wow. And we've got 60 secret bases ringing the Eurasian landmass, stretching all the way from basically Sicily to Guam, and we have the capacity right now basically to strike with a drone almost anywhere in Europe, Asia, and much of Africa with our drones. We're the only power that has that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's about to change. Well, now, but... China aside for the moment, killing people with drones, say in Yemen or in Pakistan, that's still a war crime, right? Or that I guess in right. Pakistan, that, we have that, permission from our sock puppet governments there. Is that it? Yeah, uh, basically they don't object. But there is a, a U.N. rapporteur for extrajudicial executions, and that rapporteur has raised serious doubts about the, the, you know, uh, the legality of what the United States is doing. We've even, without adversary legal proceeding, that we've killed four American citizens with drone strikes. Now, these are people that have been basically sentenced to death, and all we have is an intelligence report delivered to President Obama, who on Kill Tuesday looks over the file and approves the hits. That's not an adversary legal proceeding, all right? That, there, there's been no counsel. There's been no contestation of the intelligence. Initially, the White House insisted the Obama White House insisted that that everybody killed by a drone was the object of the attack. But now we know that's not true. The Bureau for Investigative Journalism in London, which is carefully monitoring these drone strikes in Pakistan, has established that under President Obama there have been 3,800 deaths. Of those deaths, as many as 900 have been civilians and as many as 200 have been children. So clearly there's collateral damage. People are dying in these strikes that are not, you know, the guilty parties. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so this is a problem. These are extrajudicial killings, and that is a violation of both U.S. law and international law. Sure. And then the point being, of course, not that the breaking of the law is the worst part. It's the murder that's the worst part. But what's important is that law can't stop it, really. That's what you're getting at here. There is no instrument for it. I mean, that's the, the problem is that the international rule of law, even though there is an international court of justice, and indeed there's now an international criminal court, both of which that sit at The Hague and the Netherlands, um, ultimately the strongest sanction is a moral sanction. That's why the U.S. military, particularly the judge advocate generals of all the, the four U.S. military services, were adamantly opposed to the U.S. determination after 9-11 uh, that we had the right to torture, despite the fact that we'd signed the UN Convention Against Torture. And uh, this, this was a violation of the U.S. Code of Military Justice, but more importantly, all of these senior-serving military officers were concerned that 
once we do it to somebody else's captives, they'll do it to our captives, right? And um, and, and so that there's this realization that the ultimate sanction in the rule of law is a moral sanction, you know, self-enforcement, self-restraint. And, you know, as long as we're the world's absolutely unchallenged, preeminent power, the system can operate. We can operate in this contradiction between having laws and being the world's law enforcer and also being the world's lawbreaker. I mean, that, that can kind of continue. But once our power begins to wane, and our power is waning a bit, there's no question about it, and we can be challenged, that means that then other people can be, will start breaking the laws. We, we've, in effect, ended the moral sanction against breaking these laws. And that's troubling. That's deeply troubling. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time on the show again today. Thank you, Scott. I should appreciate it. That's Alfred W. McCoy, professor of history at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And he's written for Tom Dispatch at tomdispatch.com or org. I always forget. Dot com, tomdispatch.com. Uh, and this one is running at antiwar.com today. The Real American Exceptionalism. It's uh, under the name Tom Engelhart there. Uh, you know how Tom does with his introductory essay and all that. Uh, and his latest book is Torture and Impunity, the U.S. Doctrine of Coercive Interrogation. In America today, teachers, cops, judges, and other so-called public servants make far more than the average taxpayer. And their pensions? Well, if the people knew, they'd join us. That's where you come in. Taxpayers United of America is embarking on a great new project to train activists how to take on the parasites in your communities. The entire process, from prying loose the facts to disseminating the truth to the people. The first of these great workshops is in Orlando, Saturday, March 7th. It's just $25. For more information, go to taxpayersunited.org slash govpensions. Hey, Al Scott here. If you've got a band, a business, a cause, or campaign, and you need stickers to help promote, check out thebumpersticker.com at thebumpersticker.com. They digitally print with solvent ink, so you get the photo quality results of digital with the strength and durability of old-style screen printing. I'm sure glad I sold the bumpersticker.com to Rick back when. He's made a hell of a great company out of it, and there are thousands of satisfied customers who agree with me, too. Let the bumpersticker.com help you get the word out. That's the bumpersticker.com at the bumpersticker.com. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future Freedom Foundation at fff.org slash subscribe. Since 1989, FFF has been pushing an uncompromising moral and economic case for peace, individual liberty, and free markets. Sign up now for the Future Freedom, featuring founder and president Jacob Horenberger, as well as Sheldon Richmond, James Bovard, Anthony Gregory, Wendy McElroy, and many more. It's just $25 a year for the print edition, 15 per year to read it online. That's fff.org slash subscribe. And tell them Scott sent you. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for Liberty.me, the social network and community-based publishing platform for the liberty-minded. Liberty.me combines the best of social media technology all in one place and features classes, discussions, guides, events, publishing, podcasts, and so much more. And Jeffrey Tucker and I are starting a new monthly show at Liberty.me, Eye on the Empire. It's just 4 bucks a month if you use promo code SCOTT when you sign up. And hey, once you do, add me as a friend on there at scotthorton.liberty.me. Be free. Liberty.me.